Welcome to the Startup Grind. Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Katrina. I'm the Chief Ambassador here at uh, Startup Grind. And uh, this is the month of May, which means it's a female entrepreneur month. Uh, we're really happy to have Rosalind here today, representing the uh, female tech community. So thank you for being here, Rosalind. Um, as you would know by now, um, Rosalind started um, Connections Asia uh, two years ago, just, just over two years ago. And um, last year, she raised $8 million and, uh, for the company. So I'm really excited to hear about her plans um, for the company and the product. Um, so yeah, please welcome Rosalind this evening. So the format for the evening is um, sort of 40 minutes, um, Q&A, and then opening it up to everyone to ask any questions you have. There are some seats in the forward, in the front as well, if you'd like to come. Cool. Um, so Rosalyn, how did uh, Connections Asia start? Like, was it a personal pain point in the employees' benefits slash insurance space that you wanted to solve? Um, yeah, because it is a very specific area. Um, I, I used to run Mercer um, and Marsh, the 14 countries across Asia. Um, and when I was talking to clients um, in all 14 countries, they all told me that um, even though we grew 800%, that I added no value um, and my service sucked. Um, so, and then I, I learned how to do the sorry dance, you know, because I was sorry, but there wasn't much to do about it. Um, I found out we had unaddressed pain points. Um, and what I did with CXA is address those pain points. But for five years, when I was at Mercer, I actually built business cases, went to New York, and every year for five years, they said, no, you cannot build this. Um, so this has been an, an obsession of mine yeah. forever. Um, so when the CEO uh, was pushed out, my boss was pushed out in New York, I actually left, um, told everyone that I was helping my daughter get to college, but instead I was at my house. Eventually we had 10 people in my living room. Um, and in my house we built the platform. I negotiated with DBS Bank for $5 million. I took $5 million of our family savings, um, bought a company, got the MAS to approve it, worked with a bunch of my clients at Google, Amex, um, Seagate to actually figure out if we needed to build what we needed to build. Um, and then we launched. Um, so spent $10 million, signed a personal guarantee. And um, since I signed a personal guarantee, and we, I've already spent all the money, we had real estate in the US and Canada, so we, I put everything in my husband's name. And now I have a tracker on him, <laughs> just in case he visits the other family or the other children, because I have nothing in my name anymore. Um, so we launched um, day one with these clients and with an acquisition. Um, and people found out only because I tried to move next door to, to the acquisition I bought. Um, and then people were suspicious why I had an office and I was just helping my daughter apply for college. So that's how the whole industry found out. We moved sure. next door. I guess the biggest switch would have been to move from corporate consulting into the tech environment. How difficult was it to find the right people that filled in your nine other sort of first um, team? And uh, what sort of skill set did you really have to get up to speed on, especially because it's um, back-end sort of tech? Mm. So um, my first two hires just happened to have PhDs. Um, one was a benefits expert. Um, and one was a wellness expert. So um, the benefits expert has a PhD in, in aerospace engineering. She's a rocket scientist. Um, and the other one was a Cambridge bioinformatics PhD. Um, so yeah, no, there were two PhDs in my living room. Um, and then we try to outsource the tech. Um, and I, f I found out there's no free lunch. So this guy said, 
okay, if you give me shares, I'll bill you the tech, right? And we never got the tech. And we finally got back the shares, but he held us hostage for a while. And so I had to hire tech people. Always one of those horror, um, yeah, third party sort of dev shops. Um, but so how did you then find, did you have a CTO in place um, back then or? So we're, um, poor Justin, we're on CTO number seven. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes I forget to tell him about the first four. I tell him you're number three, but no. So <laughs> we've gone through a lot of pain. So the first one was someone who had worked with me a long time ago, um, but then he moved to China. Then the second one, he moved to Russia. I don't know, I don't think there's a correlation between working for us and leaving the country, but maybe there is. <laughs> <laughs> so. so what do you think, I mean, a lot of people here are starting up businesses and looking for co-founders, and a question we often get when mm. we're registering people, how can I find a technical co-founder after number um, teeth, what, what are your sort of tips around finding certain traits that you see as potential CTOs? Well, after six mistakes, um, <laughs> so I finally convinced my OCIO from my past company to join me. It took me three years to convince him to come. Um, and he waited until he made partnership before he came. He's the first non-Rainmaker to make partner in this global firm with 20,000 people. So he's joining, he's on um, garden leave right now. So the skill sets you really need are, um, I mean, great architectural ability because you have to scale. Because if you are successful, we didn't know we would be successful, you have to be able to scale. But the second ability is the ability to manage a large group of people um, and to manage deadlines, right? So um, it's very hard to find all these traits in one person because everyone else is looking for exactly the same traits. So how do you do it? So we, we've, we've, it's been hard for us. Yeah, so what brings you to Singapore then? Um, you're an LA native. Mm. Um, yeah, why Singapore? Was it just a lot easier setting up a company here? Or yeah, what attracted you to being here? So um, it was an accident, um, but I've been here 20 years. Um, I was living in New York, I was a banker. Um, and then after eight years of banking, my husband was asked to move to London. So we found a place, I was transferring with my bank. Then I bought a lot of winter clothes for my daughter because I heard London was really expensive. Then the day the movers came, um, his company called him and said, Singapore, you need to move to Singapore. <laughs> and so, we had to get rid of the lease. I got rid of my job. We told the movers, put everything here because we've never been to Singapore. Um, and so I sold the winter clothes because you know don't need that in Singapore. Um, and we came here in 1996. Mm -hmm. So we accidentally came here. We didn't know we were coming here until the very last minute. Always a blessing in disguise. Um, so what was the hardest part about building Connections Asia then? I mean, you mentioned having hiring as quite mm. a big issue. Mm. Um, what, like, have you guys, I mean, in terms of your complexity of the platform as well, you're integrating into 480 different um, mm. insurance and service providers, so that's on the product, product front. Yes. Um, what has been the most difficult thing in the past two, two years and a bit? <sighs> I have some of my team here, so they know how difficult it is. So. The most difficult thing that we've done is we bought a 21-year-old existing business while building a brand new business. Um, and this 21-year-old business, um, the owners took all the money home. So the employees have very low, low salaries. So they try to pay so little that most people do not have O levels. And so we're trying to transform an existing business into a brand new business while building a new platform. So if we were just doing a startup alone, it would be much easier than turning around a very traditional company in a very traditional industry that land forgot, that time forgot. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's double trouble, right? So we've had to re-engineer every single process. And if anyone's ever submitted a hospital claim, 
Um, you know that insurance and brokerage is the land that time forgot. So we're trying to take that to the 21st century and we're trying to get to the future before anyone else does. So the harder thing is the clash of cultures, right? Because I've hired like a bunch of high flyers and then we bought you know, a firm with no O levels. <laughs> so um, we're integrating the two cultures, we're transforming, we're, you know, so it's a lot to do. So I, I think that's been the hardest bit. It's the transformation with the startup simultaneously at hyper speed. And then when we discovered since day one that we were successful, how do you do the two things at the same time? It's like driving an old jalopy right, 100 miles per hour, and five years later you have a brand new car, but you can't slow down, you can't stop, you have to run the existing business. So that's what we're doing at the same time. So Pan Group, <clears throat> the company that you acquired was a 21-year-old company, Singapore's largest um, employee insurance brokerage yes. uh, firm. I mean, looking in hindsight, mm. was that acquisition uh, necessary? Yes, because there are no more licenses. Sure. And our business model requires a license. Here's the reason why. Um, we thought about payment methods. If you're just a tech firm and you're charging clients for services, it's very hard to do. But if you say, um, if you appoint me as the broker and you just pay your insurance, you get everything else for free, then at no extra cost, you can help your employees personalize their benefits get healthier and you can give HR the data and we do away and digitize everything. So the business model required a brokerage license. Maybe I shouldn't have bought the largest <laughs> and the hardest, but um, it gave us immediate traction and credibility because this is the one broker that's not a global firm that had, you know, that had as part of their culture, great service. So if you have a great reputation and great service and we bring the tech and do everything else, we build on top of this. But you know, transforming a firm is always hard. So from the very beginning, how did you, how did you prioritize what you were gonna build? <clears throat> it's extremely complex. I mean, people can see your product as a SaaS, as a platform, as a mm, pass, mm. as a marketplace, as anything. I've seen it named quite differently across yes. the different media. Um, so yeah, like what, um, how did you first launch? something brand new. They wanted to um, digitize all of their health records. So we brought, we, 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 brought, we brought the blood test on site and immediately digitized it so employees can see what their health's like. And then we had everyone you know, take a questionnaire on their lifestyles to get people engaged. We aged their face according to their bad habits. Um, <coughs> And everyone freaked out, you know, especially the women, because you know you don't want to look like your mother tomorrow, and if you do, you know, you better quit your bad habits. The men just thought I still look good, right? So those were the two things we did first. We actually looked at the wellness so that we could digitize health records, we could digitize lifestyle habits, and then we decided to digitize the claims because once you figure that out you know what lifestyles are actually leading to people going to the doctor and having bad health results. Then you can actually lower the cost by modifying lifestyle habits. So we did that first, and then secondly, we built the whole insurance exchange. And that was really, really hard. And then we built the wellness piece, and then third, we built the e-commerce piece to aggregate the, the 400 vendors. Um, so it was really hard. We didn't expect to build so much. 
we keep building because clients keep asking for more. Um, now, now we're about to sign a deal where we're going to be in 10 countries. So we've opened Hong Kong. We're about to be in 10 countries. Um, so I just came back from Bangkok yesterday and we're about to sign this deal. So we have two business models. One is our own brokers or our partner brokers will go after the Fortune 500 because it's high touch. These are all the tech firms, the investment banks, consumer goods. And then we didn't expect, but a lot of the insurance companies and the reinsurance companies and the banks are going to white label our platform so they can actually help all of their clients, their SME clients, um, get insurance and wellness at the same time. So that's the second half, and we're about to sign our first deal there too. So we have two different business models, two channels. Yes, so um, on the small business side, we are. It's packaged products um, where SMEs of the banks or the insurers, the reinsurers, buy this over and over and over again. Um, but it's not just a per employee per month. It's a percentage of assets. So that's the key to our business model. When you have a commission model with a brokerage or an insurance license, you get a per percentage of the premium. So premiums are doubling every three to five years. So when you get a percentage, and it's a giant percentage, so we're taking advantage of an industry that still is paying too much, right? You think about the travel industries, percentage of the airline ticket, the hotel rental, stock brokerage, Ours is an intermediary market where we want to be the one broker left, left standing, right? Because why would you go back to an existing incumbent when all they can do is give you the best price? We do that and we allow each employee to personalize and we help them get healthier and we have the data. Same business model, same money, we do all this. So why would you ever go back? It's like travel agents. People don't use travel agents anymore. That's what we're hoping to do to the market. Oh, this is what Sue Young and I talked about in the car. <laughs> so we have said no to very tailor, like total reward statement that we want to do next year. Um, so we're really trying to focus on, you know, just repurposing treatment money to prevention money, right? And just the wellness. Um, so things that fall out of this, I want to do later. We're trying to scale right now. But I wish our salespeople would say no to more things. <laughs> Sometimes I go back and tell them. Sometimes I go back to the client and say, OK, no. <laughs> Sorry, but yes. Or we say no. Um, a lot of our clients have asked us to be in California or Australia or London or South Africa. No, we're not there. Can we just do Singapore? Can you stop asking me about your? You know, Cupertino office, sorry, no, we're not there. So we, we do get asked for to, to globalize our platform before we're ready. Yeah. So you're existing in 10 different markets, um, and they're very different looking, from China to Indonesia to the Philippines. Mm. What were your go-to-market strategies? Have they worked? Um, luckily, I've been in all these markets before. So um, I actually have clients. What I was missing are the licenses and the platform because I forced a lot of clients um, in my last company to be a pan-regional client. So I had 14 licenses in 14 countries. So they've been waiting for me to get licenses and to finish the platform. So the go-to-market strategy is different. What I did to make Mercer grow was I went over the heads of every country office and I went to the regional sophisticated office and I convinced them to give me all of their business in all of the countries. So I had to get licenses in order to do that. So it is a different go-to-market strategy in each country, but I have clients in each country plus staff that I will bring back. Sure. Um, how does Mercer feel about, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of dabbing into previous relationships. I know oh. you mentioned 
you were not allowed to reach out to a lot of these clients, ex-clients, for about a year? Yeah, one year's over. <laughs> yep. So, um, sometimes they tell clients that any day now I'm going to move back to the U.S. But why would I do that? I've just spent all my money. <laughs> And then sometimes they say things like, you sure? You know, so I, that's how they've been competing. <laughs> so, not very effective so far. I don't even know why they didn't invite me to the regional conference this year. <laughs> I think the invite's in the mailbox. Yeah, fair enough. Um, the insurance space is very interesting, especially to a lot of investors around the region right now. Mm. Are there any startups out there that are really interesting in your eyes? Um, Yes, in the insurance space, I think there's two others. One is Zenefits, mm -hmm. but they messed up a little bit because they didn't comply with the law and try to lie and stuff. Um, so no one's from insurance is there. The other is Oscar, uh, which is an insurance company that embedded wellness. So um, a lot of the investors who invested in those two are talking to us right now. Sure. And in terms of just one final question for myself, the future of CSA, um, what can we expect? Uh, the next six months, 12 months, like mm. in terms of going to different markets or a new product together? Yeah, so um, I'm in China in two weeks. We're trying to set up the office. Um, we're also working with a reinsurer because we have the data. Um, the reinsurer will package our platform every time they bid for insurance. So that means typically they would take 90% of the risk. It will come with our platform so they don't compete in price, but what we're gonna allow them to do is dynamic pricing. Insurance has never gone to dynamic pricing, but if you can imagine um, an early detection cancer product where your premiums go down as your weight go down or your cancer marker improves. Um, so, will be the first. It's like the telematics of health insurance. Telematics is in auto insurance. You know, they charge you more if you're a really bad driver. They put these things in your car. So we will probably be the first in the world with a reinsurer to, to do this. Um, so we're trying to push for a lot of firsts. I know one of my colleagues are super interested in, this, um, quest in asking this question. It's around hardware and whether you see IoT fitting in as a potential business Yes, for sure, because a lot of what we're doing, we would have to take wearables um, because that's one way insurance companies will use to make sure people actually are modifying their behaviors. Um, and so, yes, we, we've been getting wearable data is way too much. All we want to know is who won the 10,000 steps a day, who lost the most weight. Please do not send us all your data all day long, all night long, right? <laughs> we just need, like, who won, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's too much excessive data. Yep. But yes, that, that is a part of it. Um, the reinsurer working with us, they also want to look at the aging population. So could you sell insurance to people in China and India who's buying it for their parents? But with the insurance, there's also these devices to make sure your parents are not falling, they're complying with their medicine, um, you know, that they're safe, there's um, second opinions. So, yeah, no, there be devices in their homes to make sure their parents are okay because all the kids have gone to the cities mm -hmm. and left their parents behind. So, um, even the, the uh, cancer product, we're going to integrate um, cancer diagnosis, um, treatment, prevention, recovery, all the different providers. So we're building the whole ecosystem for that. And in the workplace, we're actually going to add um, pension systems so that we become health, wealth, and lifestyle in the workplace behind single sign-on so that we free up money that you didn't need. If you're married to someone, they're already covering you for insurance. Can you repurpose some of this treatment money to prevention? Can you repurpose it some for savings? Can you repurpose the rest for your lifestyle for personal development? So we free up money for employees to personalize you know, their health, wealth, and lifestyle. So it's, um, 
we'll probably be the only e-commerce in the workplace, and then we become the engine for insurers for all their SMEs to do the same. Hi, my name is Hemant. Yes. So how do you balance those two tensions coming from one side where it's too much and other side where it's too little data? Yeah, so I work with all the insurance companies because I have to integrate to them. Um, <laughs> integrate is not a real word. <laughs> so, um, so we built claims apps so we could digitize the claims. Um, and only the essential information goes in. Some of the insurance companies, when they get this file, print it and data entry in their system. Um, that's why they don't have data. <laughs> they haven't digitized the claims. They also don't have the health data. So they don't have the lifestyle habits. They don't have the health screening results. How can you do the correlations? You know, so the reinsurers have a lot of data because they're taking all the risks. But the insurance companies, because they haven't digitized, they're white labeling us so they can finally do it. Yeah, so we're moved the insurance companies faster than they're moving. But what if we and the reinsurers are the only ones left? What if the reinsurer takes 100% of the risk, we do all of the administration and capture the data? and we build rules so you can manually, automatically process these claims. Right now in Asia, in every single country, every single insurer, you have human beings looking at a piece of paper and deciding is it paid or not paid. There's nothing automatic about it. So what if we do all of the administration, the reinsurers does all of the insurance and the product development, and we take out the manufacturer in the future? because we can dynamically price. They don't capture that data. You know why? Because they're, they use intermediaries. I am the last mile. They've never built the last mile, but I am the last mile. So that's what we decided to do. So the reinsurers understand it faster than the insurers. Do we... Uh talk a little bit about your investor profile, obviously, you know, yourselves. Um, so, you I'm the biggest investor. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're in for 10. So, uh, me and my husband. My husband's always asking for his money back, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to track where you are. <laughs> so, um, so, we have the largest, our second investor is a PE fund. They use their VC arm. Um, they're in Southeast Asia. The third um, is founded by the original CTO of Alibaba. So, he's setting us up in China. Um, and the fourth is a healthcare fund backed by a Silicon Valley firm. And then my husband has a few friends who owns brokers that we were going to buy, but we decided after this experience, no, we're not going to buy any more brokers. That was it. I age rapidly, and I don't want to age anymore because I'll be too old. So it's, it's, we've only done Series A. Um, we'll probably look at Series B next year. And can you say how much you've raised? Yes, yeah, so we, I, we put in 10, then another 11 million. So. That's so far. Um, luckily, the broker that we own is very profitable, even though they have 80 people. It's very profitable. Can you imagine once we automate how profitable it will be? We, we could actually be swapping notes on that because your situation absolutely parallels uh, one of my businesses, which would be custom. Mm. Digitization, re digitization. Yes. Yes, yes. And then, and then, you know, because you control the last mile, you own the information. Yes, I capture all the data. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> we love, 
We love being in the last mile. It's because you just have to pick industries that are intermediary industries that are so fragmented. There's like seven in the supply chain and aggregate them all and be the last mile, right? So no, that, that is, we will own the distribution. That's what we want. Well, no more sleeves. <laughs> there are no more. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And, then, and there's so many industries like this all over the world, right? Every intermediary industry can be disrupted. But it's just digitizing stuff that was always paper for hundreds of years. Mm. Uh, companies, uh, but do you guys feel comfortable with uh, raising future rounds? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, our, our issue is we keep telling people we're not raising money right now, <laughs> so it, talking to me doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we're probably just do some type of bridge just to get us over to Series B because we're signing more distribution. Our, our issue has been, we don't have enough tech people, we're actually turning away clients. So we're like the saddest startup you've ever heard of, turning away clients, right? So no, that's, we, we, need, we need the scale, and I need my old guy back so that we can go overseas and offshore and outsource and scale up. I think we've got a good question here. Hi, my name is Helen. I work at a bank. <laughs> um, when you decide to start your own business, I'm sure you, you know you had a stable job. You're not very young, so I'm sure it was not the <laughs> <You> easy, <can> <laughs> easiest decision you know you have made. Yes. Um, and I was just curious, what made you inspired to do that, um, and how you know confident you are you're going to be successful. Um, Thank this, you. this is my third startup, but um, my first postmenopausal one, right? <laughs> so um, I wouldn't have put 10 million down if I didn't think we were going to make it. But I've been talking to clients for, you know, forever, and I've been tr obsessed about this idea for five years. Everyone, I talk about my vision every quarter for eight years, right? <laughs> so. No, I probably knew every detail of what we were going to do. So, yeah, it was a stable job, but once, you know, all my sponsors left and I was so, such a rebel at the last firm, it was like a dog pile on me, right? Because I changed so many things to grow an O industry 800%. We got to about a billion dollars in premium. I had to change so much in the firm. And if you've ever been in professional services, it's like, a company of professors looking for consensus, right? And me. <laughs> so, no, we changed a lot to, to grow. So, no, we knew exactly what we were gonna build. The, the question I had was, would they buy from a startup versus a global firm that's in 100 countries? Because my three big competitors, they've all consolidated. They're in 100 countries each, and then there's us. And, and we've been winning their biggest clients. First of all, congratulations uh, for um, trying to intermediate uh, a lot of intermediate, uh, particularly the in insurance industry, which is very archaic and has not uh, kept up with the times, uh, even more so than the banking industry. Um, but, and being the last mile, it all sounds like a very beautiful fairy tale. What do you see as uh, your key challenges going forward? Mm. Um, which areas do you, you see pitfalls? Because it's good to come up so far, but uh, put the pies in the eating, so the execution is key. Yes. Where do you see the pitfalls? And how do you plan to address them? And what uh, do you feel that is lacking right now that you need to help you overcome those three bumps? Oh, I can go on all day. Sorry. <laughs> I have like 
pitfalls every hour. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Um, one of my biggest pitfalls is tech. How do we scale? We, we have about 20 people. Um, we need much more than that. Um, operations, how do you re-engineer a very old operations that's been running for 21 years and no one wants to change it? And then the clients don't want to change either. They want to keep giving us paper. I want to fire all these clients, but I can't because I need the revenue. And so how do we re-engineer and get clients to change their mind and offer something better? Um, how do I build out in each country the differences so that I don't have to use so much development time, right? How do I simultaneously um, build out the enterprise model um, while doing this, while trying to fix this old firm? Um, talent, I never, never, never have enough talent. I have too many of the wrong talent, too few of the right talent, right? So I have like shit happens every hour and it's just, we just have to bounce back from all the adversity. So it's, it's really hard. It's brick by brick. Yes. Yes. better. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if I was able to start from scratch with no fixing, that would have been the best, but there are no more licenses. So what do you do in that case, right? In some industry, they, they have regulatory barriers. Of course, it's a barrier for others coming in too, right? So sometimes you have to bite the this, maybe this is why no one else tried to fix it before, because it's so damn hard, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's been happening for the last two years. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's, that's we, we just didn't expect to be successful at the same time. That, that was the issue. We just thought, all right, we got time. No, no, there's no time, oh my God. And so, yeah, no, so how do you juggle both simultaneously has been hell, right? It's, it's really hard. People are burned out, right? But we bring fresh people in, <laughs> and so. <laughs> no, it's, it's just. Look, it's, it's just super hard. And we don't always know the right things to do. We make a lot of mistakes. Um, so, sorry, uh, just regarding licenses and compliance. I, I assume just buying license is not enough. You have to stay compliant with license. Or it's just like entrance fee and after that you're... No, a you have to stay compliant. Otherwise, like Zenefits, the CEO got fired. <laughs> and they're going to try to throw him in jail. <laughs> so, like, are there any, how, to say, how do you stay compliant? Are there any limitations? Is it hard? Or, uh, it's hard. It's hard. If you look at the MAS requirements for the technology, it's about 100 tabs in this worksheet. And then um, all of the due diligence we have to go through for every bank, every tech company to get in is just massive. That's, that's why it costs so much to do it. 
the infrastructure, the data security, the data privacy, everything is really hard. Yeah, if I can not be compliant, that would be great, but it's, uh, but it's a barrier to others coming in, right? Are they gonna buy a license? Are they going to build all this infrastructure? Are they gonna go after the hardest clients? <laughs> Um, no, it has not been easy. And now I'm trying to do the legal due diligence for China, and the law keeps changing, and every lawyer I talk to has a different interpretation of the law. And they stop, you know, they stop offering new licenses for years because one broker took 250 million of client money and left the country, so they just stopped. Um, so no, every country is different. Every country is regulated. Every country has different regulations. Every country has different joint venture partners and foreign direct investment limits. And yeah, no, every country is different. Luckily, I've, I've run them all. So I understand you know, some of the compliance issues, but we would have to comply in all of them. Yeah, it, it's not easy. Yes. Uh, so, but then you also mentioned you partnered with brokers. Uh, yes. So what, what is the actual model? I mean, you know, are you going to be a license holder everywhere you legally can be, or? Good question. So. Bought in Singapore in retrospect. Um, I think I still needed to buy because we had to use an existing broker to re-engineer every single process. Um, and also, I didn't think clients would come to me if I was just brand new tech firm, you know, n you know not, no license or anything. Um, in Hong Kong, you can apply for licenses. So I did. Um, but after this experience, I decided not to buy any more. <laughs> and I approach um, a global broker. They also have a single owner. We have a single owner and structure a revenue share deal. And that'll probably be announced in a couple of weeks. So they bought brokers in 10 countries. So it'll still be your front end? Yes, it'll be their license, our platform, my clients that I'm bringing back, the pan-regional clients. And so um, the business is so lucrative, these pan regional clients are worth like a million US each per year. It scales rapidly once you have all these countries. Sure. And so, yeah, no, it's a shocking, it's a shocking model when you find out what insurance brokers get. And I discovered it in my last job because I accidentally went there. And so, um, yeah, no, it's, um, I think margins will get smaller and smaller like every other industry, but right now for 100 years it's been like this. So by the time they found out what you do and how you make money and start offering it, you'll be on to the added value stuff. Right? Yes, speed. <laughs> speed is important. Yep, you're right. Uh, is that an operations type question? You guys are gonna operate in 10 countries. How yes. So um, we're gonna have to build share services for operations so that the only part we're gonna do in country is the regulated piece, the placing of the insurance. Everything else, I will have a regional team that works with clients um, who are specialists in wellness or benefits. Um, and then I'm building, it's the same platform, but I'm building a share, um, share services for the operations so that they have 10 languages, 
they have access, information at their fingertips to all the employees in all of these countries. So we're standardizing the reporting, the servicing. Um, we'll probably have to pick a lower cost country than Singapore to build that. Um, could be multiple countries. I used to build share services in China, Malaysia, and Philippines. So I may do part of the same. Um, and I may need to embed people in each one of the licenses to do the regulated piece. Yeah, so we, that's the only way to scale. You don't want to do everything times 10. You want to do it times one, you know, to service everyone. Um, there's so many things, but <laughs> I probably would have built out the tech team much sooner, right? So that we'll be much further in tech than we are now. So I, I would have scaled in my house, despite my husband kicking us out, I would have scaled sooner in my house, but we only had 10 chairs. My, my husband actually kicked us out because um, one guy was living in my guest bedroom. I forget he was there every single day. It's like, oh my God, you look like a terrorist. And every day I would wake up to him. And um, my daughter, before she went to college, had to do her eighth grade piano exam. And she was practicing the same song every day, all day long, right? My dog, because the piano was on, would bark at everyone. I had these two cats warm themselves on my laptop and so every time we skype there's like fur right that's all you see and every time i had a business call it's like so noisy i would you know these windows in this office is like very thin so i'm sorry so it was it was really hard but i i, I should have scaled the tech team much sooner i i just didn't think we it it would we, we would have traction so fast day one that 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 was the issue we didn't expect that You talk about wellness and the kind of benefits and disability for people to move their money from, I guess, their sickness into their wellness benefits. Yes. How do you build a wellness e-commerce platform and how do you find interesting and good benefits be different than the traditional dietitian and that mm. large corporation tend to be probably very effective, but I'm particularly interested in how did you aggregate benefits around sport? which mm. are very linked to wellness. Yeah, so we aggregated about 400 different wellness, fitness, apps, diabetes management, sleep, smoking, diet, nutritionist, pole dancing, right? All kinds of stuff. The only one I turned down was this funeral home and I told them, you are death, not wellness, right? So. Everything else, you know, there's all kinds of organic foods. So we're just trying to, because every single person's different, so we're just trying to get as many different things as possible. And then when people can decide, and we give them recommendations based on their lifestyle habits and their claims and also their health scores, um, here's what you can do to improve. And by the way, um, your employer is willing to reward you right, and give you more money in your wallet if you do this all year long. And what we're trying to do that's really fancy is um, at the end of the year, um, you can sweep your balance into charities so that you feel really good and you have a choice. So we're working you know, with Community Chess and everyone else so that people can do that. And we're gonna try to do that in every country. But it really is, everyone keeps adding more vendors. Um, McDonald's didn't want us to add any food choices. <laughs> um, Diageo, no alcohol question, please. Philip Morris, no smoking question, please. Um, and the, but some people added gadgets, others added all their learning and development and courses and get your MBA. So everyone's adding different things. Some people are adding travel. So every firm decides what they wanna add. So we just keep adding it in and we negotiate this count so your money goes much further.
Awesome. So thanks everyone um, for contributing questions. Roslyn will be around to mingle and network after. Um, we'd like to thank the Hub for hosting this event and DBS as well. Um, so yeah, thanks for being here this evening and representing the female tech community.